Um, okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are starting at 11 a.m. And uh, we just want to say hello. Hi, whilst waiting for all of the panelists to turn up. Uh, okay, my name is Justine Vaz. I'm from the Habitat Foundation on Penang Hill. Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Ahmad Zafir. Right? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Selamat pagi. Okay, Ahmad, Ahmad is going to, from, to be is the Vice President of the Society of Conservation Biology, uh, Malaysia chapter. And this, uh, they are co-hosting with us. And uh, this is now is a good time to appreciate the people that are working behind the scenes. Uh, so we'd like to thank Natasha, who's on the back of this uh, broadcast, as well as Melissa and uh, Professor uh, Dr. Jayaraj as well on the chats. All right. So as people are starting to uh, come in and register, come and just say hi. Uh, even tell us where you're coming from and uh, what you're interested, what draw, what drew you to this particular web forum. All right. Hi, good morning, Daniel. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. We're so happy to see you. Actually. <laughs> Is everything okay with your tech? Everything right. should be okay. I'm in okay. a budget hotel. Hopefully, right. my uh, tethering will last until okay. two hours. Okay. okay. All right. Oh, let's cross fingers then. All right. So uh, let's start. Shall we start? Yes. Okay. So uh, wait, this is this is okay. So anyway, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for spending your Saturday with us. I'm Justine Vaz from the Habitat Foundation, uh, and with me are the panelists of today's session called "Strengthening the Links Between Ecotourism and Conservation." All right. So uh, on from on the screen, uh, Dr. Ahmad Zafir, who will be co-hosting with me, uh, and our very special uh, guest expert, Professor Aman Hamza. Right. A wave. <laughs> okay, and our special uh, perspectives from people working in conservation. We are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Chen Pelknyok from the Turtle Conservation Society of Malaysia. Thanks for joining us. And also, and from the point of business, from private sector and the business of making ecotourism work, uh, thank welcome Alex Lee. Uh, from Terrapuri Heritage Village near City at Lagos. Okay, so we're going to uh, go right in. Um, but first, we want to say why are we having this particular uh, topic, right? Um, and the purpose of the Habitat Expert Series is really to nurture the connections and the conversations that are needed in order to achieve effective biodiversity conservation. And we found that the way that has really been exciting about having these sessions is bringing people across different disciplines and other sectors. And that's why the, the, big, the diversity of points of view has been really, really relevant and important. Um, so uh, in introducing the National Ecotourism Plan, I think uh, once, uh, uh, so I'm going to invite or explain how we're going to run the session. So the prof has got a lot to cover because he's going to familiarize us. He's going to pop the hood on the National Ecotourism Plan and how what it was created for and what it's intended to do, right? And that will take a bit of time. But I mean, we're hoping that these plant a lot of questions in your heads and you're very welcome to put them into the chat and our production team will highlight the ones that really need to be spoken to. And we'll try to get to all of your relevant questions. Okay, and then later on, uh, Ahmad will introduce the other panelists and then they will share those perspectives as well. All right, this is the first of two parts. So in the second part, uh, it's gonna be even more interesting, but I'll let Prof Amran talk to you about that later. All right, so um, I'm going to now invite uh, Professor Amran Hamza to uh, get ready to make his presentation. 
All right, so as an introduction, uh, Prof uh, is an uh, expert in tourism planning. He calls himself an academic practitioner, which I think is cool because it's a, both a thinker and a doer, right? And as we speak now, Prof is actually uh, doing, he is currently doing field work in Kedah, uh, a secret location, and uh, well, he'll tell you more. Uh, uh, Prof, uh, thank you. Are we, in, on the local scale, you've had a role in uh, putting together the National Ecotourism Plan 216 to 2. 025, right, as well as the National Tourism Plan. Um, but internationally, you've also had a huge presence, right? We, in the past, you've been the co-chair of Til Chepa, which a lot of people don't really remember what that stands for, right? Uh, what, what's the, is the IUCN theme on local communities, indigenous peoples and uh, protected areas broadly. So, I mean, there's also very current, uh, is also that Prof Arms Arman is uh, IUCN regional counselor. So he's very up to speed on international best practices in that interface between conservation and tourism. All right, so without talking further, uh, Prof Raman, please come. <laughs> okay, so we're all going to stand by the side now. You sharing your screen? You are going to, yeah. Okay, it's good, it's good. So just uh, put it to presentation, thank you. Okay, shall I start now, Justin? Hello? Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Justin, and good morning, everyone. I'm in a small hotel room in Sungai Petani. Uh, I was informed that the Wi-Fi doesn't work here, uh, so I'm using my tethering. It will hold for the next uh, two hours at least, unless someone calls me and it will disturb my uh, reception. Anyway, without further ado, uh, thanks again for inviting me. The, I'm going to talk about the ecotourism clusters uh, in the context of the national ecotourism plan. I was a lead consultant for this national ecotourism plan. It has been uh, published or launched um, many years ago, 2016. I'm sure not many of you know about this, but I'm not going to talk about the whole plan. It will not do justice to this plan. I will focus only on the uh, ecotourism clusters and I will end up a bit on the other aspects of the plan. So please, can someone, uh, Justin, your next one. So quickly, I'm going to talk about a bit on how ecotourism is changing and focusing more on the cluster approach as a tourism planning tool. And then I'm going to show some examples and end up by uh, sharing the other aspects of the plan. And I'm sure there are many questions that you know uh, you will ask afterwards. I'm happy to answer this in the context of the National Ecotourism Plan. So many of you are aware, I think, that we have already had a National Ecotourism Plan way back in 1996. It was done by WWF, uh, of course, with the then Ministry of Tourism. It's very comprehensive. It was just like a manual, having all these guidelines on developing trails, interpretive center, and so on. And I believe and I, that the 48 potential ecotourism sites that were recommended were, uh, it was really a groundbreaking effort because before then, we didn't know where to develop and what to showcase. But at the same time, unfortunately, I think the country wasn't quite ready for ecotourism then. The private sector, you know, did not uh, understand what is ecotourism. And in terms of implementation, it didn't go as well as what was intended especially uh, when most of the ecotourism sites developed by the state governments were not those in the 48, you know, uh, recommended. Anyway, that was many years ago and the plan should have been uh, reviewed 10 years after 1996, but please. So eventually the ministry, next please, Ministry of uh, Tourism decided to uh, finally uh, come with a new plan and in response to these challenges. And I think many of you are aware that we suffer from uh, what is called tired ecotourism products in comparison to our neighbors, lacking innovation, poor interpretations, and and uh, our neighbors are, you know, uh, already in front of us. The, some of them were behind us, some have caught up, and some ahead in ecotourism. And, uh, a lot of issues regarding this incompatibility in terms of tourism, tourist behavior, especially when there's sudden influx of tourists, domestic tourists to national parks, and uh, 
I would like to stress that, you know, the social construct of national parks have changed. Uh, when, for example, Tamanagara was established, it was a place for wilderness, tranquility. Now, if you go, many would just straight away go to the, you know, uh, the bridge. This is, uh, and then, so it's just a place where, to, for families to get together, have fun, merriment. And now we are suffering also from these uh, challenges, not only due to climate change, but now, of course, everybody knows, COVID-19 pandemic is putting a lot of pressure on how do we manage our uh, ecotourism development. Next, please. Next, please, Justin. Hello. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about, before I start, just go a bit on how we define ecotourism. When I was involved in a, a project in Pearl State Park many, many years ago, uh, it was difficult to get people to understand that there is, we cannot just plan for ecotourism because we don't, ecotourists don't wear hats and say, I'm an ecotourist. I'm a firm believer in educating tourists. So that is why when we talk about ecotourism, we have to look into the soft ecotourism for people who, who are not, uh, do not fancy the, the hard ecotourism, the more challenging, the uh, equal, the adventurous type, types of activities, but also in the middle between soft and hard, uh, there's an eco adventure. So it's a very uh, wide spectrum of ecotourism now. And if you say that how many percent of uh, the total tourists are eco tourists, previously you can say 15, 20, now you can say that. The question is no longer relevant. The uh, more relevant question is how many people, how many tourists would partake in any form of ecotourism? It could be up to 90%. Even though they are not ecotourists, uh, take the type, the traditional typology of what they are. Next, please. So in the plan, uh, next, please. In the plan that we developed through a very uh intense very uh, comprehensive public engagement process we uh i think there's one slide before this mainstream eco tourists can you go back to the one slide before this so yeah so we look at eco tourism from the perspective of the tourists there are uh, a huge chunk of e people who are attracted to eco tourism are not really coming there because of ecotourism. One day uh, happen to pass by, and since there are something near to them that is uh, having this, selling this ecotourism experience, so they're willing to enjoy some kind of soft ecotourism, as long as it's not difficult to go. And previously, when you talk about urban ecotourism, people say it's an oxymoron. It cannot be uh, ecotourism when it's in urban areas, but you can see now there are many ecotourism sites They are located in even at the periphery of uh, urban areas. So this is the changing face of ecotourism. Next, please. But yes, next. Next, please. Justin, please, can you push uh, on with the slides? Hello. Hello, OK. So another segment of ecotourism is what we call special interest uh, tourism. And this could be uh, people who are coming here because of botany, uh, people who are attracted to orchids, uh, different species of orchids, frogs, amphibians, of course, bird watching, wildlife. Theoretically, these are very low in volume, They're very, very high yield, because a lot of these uh, special interest tourists are willing to pay a premium for a very deep experience in ecotourism. Uh, but it requires very depth in interpretation, very good storytelling, guides who are uh, who have very high product uh, knowledge, and this is the kind of special interest that Malaysia should be leveraging on rather than the uh, people who come for the shallow experience of ecotourism. Next, please. Next. Okay. But what is more interesting is the number of youth, the millennials, uh, who are attracted to eco-adventure. So if you want to take a strict definition of eco, 
uh, adventure tourism, of course there is one, but we take a very practical, very pragmatic view that you can have eco adventure. And this, I would say, is a low hanging approach because there are so many youth who would like to go uh, for such activities, but we require safe, high safety standards and, of course, some kind of certification. And in certain areas, you may need to have sophisticated equipment uh, for, for example, caving. Next, please. Next. Next, please. It's not moving as fast as I'm supposed to talk. So can can I get someone to push? Hello, uh, Justin. Can you get? Yeah. So I'm going to straight away go into my main the main focus of my talk, which is the clustering. So why do we need clustering? I will explain later. But uh, I think. Again, I've missed a few slides. Can you go back to one or two more slides be before this? Yes, before that one. Can you go one more back? OK, it's, a, it's OK. So in terms of ecotourism development, especially in the context of the National Ecotourism Plan, is uh, it's very difficult to develop ecotourism because of the high cost in providing infrastructure in remote areas. And in terms of uh, economies of scale, which you usually relate to tourism, you cannot get that because inherently ecotourism does not mean that you need to build 100 room, 200 room, 300, 400 room, uh, room resorts or hotels. And this is where, for example, in on Bukit Fraser, when they developed that, those kind of development after the, the, the bit of golf course, and this that was the economies of scale that they were going for that was in a inappropriate for such a very uh, pristine environment uh, and then the lack of local capacity are all the issues that when we develop ecotourism in remote areas especially so we need to uh, apply a different kind of approach it's something that is called uh, clustering so clustering this is a new definition a critical mass of competitive and or even all complementary tourism products including uh, one or more major attractions in the concentrated geographical area. So that's the formal uh, definition, meaning that we get together all the different uh, products and services. And it's very important that we use this in ecotourism, especially because it is very suited to areas which are lacking in infrastructure and lacking in human capital. Next, please. Okay. So the cluster approach is not new. In fact, it has been used in, uh, especially Tasmania. They have developed different kinds of clusters, potential clusters, embryonic clusters, emerging clusters. They have been used in uh, Turkey, uh, Spain, and so on. So we have looked at the literature, and while doing this uh, national ecotourism plan, they said maybe this could work, especially what is called the micro cluster. Next, please. Okay, basically what the clustering process is all about, uh, whenever someone opens up, for example, a tourism and ecotourism uh, pro product, and then a few more would follow the same path, and you can have some ecologists, you know, one and then follow a second one, third or fourth one. This is called the clustering. And by doing so, you are increasing the economies of scale, but also the economies of scope. I want to explain it a bit more. And by, by enhancing the economies of scope, and then you can then pool you know, our market. We can have a common strategies, kind of common tactics. So cooperation and networking is very fundamental in any clustering process. This is the concept. Next, please. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I cannot. Uh, I think the the slides are a bit slow for me to, yeah, next. So um, what are the benefits of clustering? So if you develop something uh, in ecotourism product in a remote destination, uh, they become isolated and it's very expensive to do so. This is why we need to have a, some kind of integrated system, uh, systemic uh, uh, processes can be enhanced then. So the, what 
clustering can provide is that you can then have uh, uh, improve the business environment. It can help cooperation. It can stimulate entrepreneurship. It can attract investments, and it will create a critical mass, which is very crucial in any tourism business. And afterwards, I think uh, Alex Lee can share this in his uh, in his talk. Next, please. So this is conceptually what clustering means, and I'm going to share with you the, uh, there are three types of clustering. I'm not going to um, dis discuss uh, in detail each one, but the horizontal, it's vertical and diagonal. So the vertical is, is rarely found, unless you're talking about on Cameron Highlands where you have, for example, the flower industry, so the whole supply chain, you know, from where tourists go and visit the plantations, uh, right to where they supply the orchids to the hotels. This is the vertical. I'm going to focus a bit more on the horizontal and diagonal. I'm showing one example in a while of the uh, clustering process in uh, Thailand. And then I'm going to show how we are using this in the context of the National Ecotourism Plan. So can you please move on, uh, please, to the next one. Yeah, I'm waiting for these slides to move on. Uh, okay, this is a place that we visited, Muang in Phuket. It used to be uh, rubber, small holdings, and then one uh, very innovative American, young American, uh, started what is called the uh, Tiger Muay Thai Training Center. It doesn't offer only Muay Thai, but it offers weight reduction. Uh, you can stay there for a year, you know, and to lose weight, you can. Uh, they offer jujitsu, any form of wellness uh, they put under their services. And this then triggered what is called a horizontal clustering, meaning to say that there were three uh, local uh, spa or local these, uh, martial arts training center open up in that small village, all following the same model that Tiger Muay Thai has followed. So you can see that horizontal clustering has managed to evolve in this village, and this has transformed the socioeconomic uh, uh, levels of the local community. But more importantly, horizontal clustering, meaning that the same products, they are offering the same services, now are being complemented by, next please, the vertical, sorry, the diagonal clustering. So let's wait for this to come out. So. Yes, diagonal clustering really is specialization. So instead of another guy coming up with another tiger, uh, sorry, martial arts training center, uh, a clever guy in the village say, oh, I want to then develop a massage center, outlet selling healthy food, because these are all very fit uh, people going there, and supplements, laundry, souvenir shops. And uh, suddenly the whole village then becomes, you know, transformed into a rural tourism, a thriving rural tourism enterprise, and they are all then specializing in different forms of services, and they have really transformed the socioeconomic uh, base of the local communities. And this is, even though it's not ecotourism based, a fine example of how clustering has managed to transform the community. Next, please. So let's go on into what has, is happening in Malaysia. So in our study, we then discovered that for a clustering to materialize, you need to have someone who is called an accelerator or accelerators. So we look at all the thriving community-based tourism in Malaysia, and we saw that within uh, Maram Panare near Stuart Lands, there is Terapuri Heritage Resort. Alex Lee is the owner. He's here with us today. And he has developed this fine, beautiful <coughs> uh, former uh, palaces, Malay palaces, put together. He collected it for 220 years and it's very high end. But more importantly is that Alex does not provide any services, his own boats to do, you know, uh, river cruise or uh, he does not uh, have any kinds of uh, activities, but he allows the local communities to be, to provide those. So, for example, if you want to do uh, you know, wildlife river cruise, and you can have a local pachi to be able to perform that. And also you have to go have a home visit, visiting, uh, you want to watch any cultural performance, you can have it in the resort, or you can go to the village to, uh, to observe them. So what is being done here is that in the clustering, so we need an accelerator, a local champion, so to speak, 
And this is a process that can also help conserve the uh, nature and preserve culture and spread economic benefits. And next, please. So next. Uh, I'm still being held back by, by, by the slides. Hello. Uh, okay. So in terms of the dynamics of clustering, what can be achieved is that we need, uh, it could be an outsider, but it could be someone from the own village who can be called a local champion and he can play the role of accelerating the uh, tourism growth in the community. But there should be also access to capital, especially in the micro credit facilities. Sometimes the, the conditions to, to get these facilities are a bit challenging. And, and then you need to build out these cooperatives. Uh, so it cannot be done alone. So local cooperatives can become the, uh, a network. And this network can link up to other network. And by doing so, you can expand the market and size of the economic pie. Next. Okay, so if you develop clusters, it might not work if you do not develop networks. So within the clusters, these are physical. Clusters do not have any geographical boundaries. It can be uh, anywhere you want, as long as there is uh, you know, a buy-in, but you need someone or you need an entity to drive it this is why then the network or networking is very crucial for the clusters to flourish so this can even facilitate public private sector partnerships and you can see that what the clusters it could be formal on the left the blue it could be informal it could be government driven it could be ngo driven and i can see that in city wetlands now since they declared that as a state park the cluster or the network is Developing now, not only under the government, but also through Alex driving it, uh, through the community-based uh, organizations, Powanis, and so on. These are the form of networking that will be very crucial for the network to facilitate bottom-up decision-making process. So what we are providing through the clusters is not a top-down answer to solutions for eco-tourism development, but how do we facilitate decision-making, but you can see that the, the the scope is not only for that development it's self-help it covers joint promotion and conflict resolution because a lot of time the issues are really how do we get consensus how do you you know so rather than trying to identify just new ways of doing things but how do you resolve local conflicts so that they go united as a as a cluster next please And in the National Ecosystem Plan, we have uh, proposed 60 ecotourism clusters. And they, these are all based on what the state governments, what the local communities and the industry players have suggested based on their knowledge of what could be successful. We did not uh, pick up from thin air and say that these are the clusters, but they were built on really consensus over so many different uh, meetings. Okay, these are where they are. If you can have the time, you can even look into the plan and you can see where they are. Next, please. Okay. We do not have time in the plan to come up with every detailed cluster. So, in fact, we only could cover uh, cover in detail six clusters, an example, and they are clusters that are either established clusters or they are, could be emerging clusters. and conceptually within the clusters the key thing is that there must be a key keystone species so we want to preserve something a keystone could be maybe the kinapatangan where they have got you know, the river they got the orang uh, orangutan the pygmy elephants those are the keystones that will make people come all the way from uh, america to, to the place and then you need to identify the supporting products the tourist flows who are who are the market segments you know what are the issues and then Every cluster will have an action plan in terms of product development, human resource, marketing, product, uh, and then destination management. So for the other 54 clusters, we did not have the time to do this. It was not in our TOR to go into that micro planning. It's a strategic plan. But at the same time, we did introduce what is called proposed a, a, a toolkit for subsequent development of these clusters. Next, please. 
next. <laughs> Please bear with me. I'm just going to show a few. If you have the time, go into the plan. You can download it. This is a Meram Panari Ecosystem Cluster. This stretches from Meram Panari. We identified the uh, keystone. You know, the steel wetlands is a keystone. We need to protect the city wetlands and all those uh, details in there. And we identified what would be the uh, ecotourism, you know, products and the supporting products. And we identified the tourist flows. We know which segments uh, we can attract. And from this, you have to populate this plan. This is not the answer. So as a base, the state government and the other agencies can use this plan to develop, you know, populate it. And as a base for developing the cluster, developing uh, creative networks and decision making then can be facilitated uh, through a very bottom up approach. And if this is followed and then you have a very solid decision making process rather than a physical plan, we do not create a physical plan uh, that provides answers. But this is where you then develop this based on uh, collaboration, based on consensus building. Next, please. So. I have three clusters to show you. Uh, Sandakan Kinabatangan, we know very well that the Kinabatangan local Kinabatangan is very, very popular, but it has a gateway from Sandakan. And within Sandakan town, you know, you have the, the Orangutan Sapilok Center, but there's so much ecotourism uh, development. And if you cluster them together, tourists can stay a week or, or more, and they can then find a reason to go to Kinabatangan. The cluster also is say that. Let's go, for example, to uh, the Bloom Rainforest. Oh, it's a long way to go, you know, there's nothing in between. So we have developed also uh, a cluster that comes from KL, goes straight to uh, the Royal Town of Kolakansa, stopping by at Lengo and ending up in, in the Royal Bloom. So that makes the trip so wonderful. You can have everything put into, you know, mobile apps, information put in place. And this is for self-drive tourists. And the, the and then you can spread the benefits rather than say it's a long three four hour ride to the end. No one wants to go, so the cluster will facilitate you know this kind of self drive uh, holiday packages and very customized tours. Next, please. Next, I'm waiting for slide <laughs> slides. I'm sorry, and there can be more time because of the delay in this. I don't know why. Uh, Okay, now this is where my kampung lah, Taiping. I'm from Taiping. Uh, Taiping is very famous. It gets 700,000 tourists a year. Uh, Kuala Sepetang is only four kilometers away. Uh, less than 5% of tourists who go to Taiping would want to venture to Kuala Sepetang, despite, you know, we have got all those wonderful mangroves and the, uh, the food there. And you also have Anak Kurau for some kind of semi-adventure tourism, Bukit Merah too. So why don't we sell this, you know, as an ecotourism cluster? So when, so we develop all the same, uh, you know, Keystone attraction, Matang mangrove forest, and then all the supporting products and the community-based tourism in Kuala Sepetang and so on. Again, this should be used as the basis for developing really uh, a critical mass so that ecotourism can make money to plow it back into conservation. Next, please. So there are many more in the plan that we have suggested, but again, as I said, it's not the answer. You have to work on it. So let's, I want to finish with a few more slides. So the other part of the, of the plan, uh, the plan is not, not all about the classes alone. Those are the, the, the tool that we use. So the plan, National Ecotourism Plan, uh, probably should be disseminated more. They are focus areas. Uh, one is the investments in ecotourism. Second is tourism concessions. Synergy, the third one, between ecotourism and conservation. The fourth, ecotourism marketing. And the last one is ecotourism clusters. We propose eight, 18 strategies, 84 actions. Next, please. I just quickly go through each and uh, five, each of the five. Okay. Uh, investments in ecotourism. We had no investments in ecotourism for many years. Nobody wants to because, you know, the ROI takes more than 10, 15, 20 years. So how we develop you know, actions and strategies to create a conducive business environment. We want to attract international and local investments, investors in ecotourism. I know if you have uh, put the entrance fee to a national parks, five ringgit, 10 ringgit, no one wants to invest. So this is where our problem is. How do we also 
you know, create this, uh, the uh, conducive environment. So we have three strategies, action for this, to create investments in ecotourism. Next, uh, please, in relation to investments, we need to come up with a new business models. So next is concessions, okay? Tourism concessions, when we suggested this, we didn't get any support at all, you know? Uh, the ministry then in charge of natural resources there is not our our baby to look into ecotourism despite national parks you know should the the fact that national parks should have uh, ecotourism components so the the, the idea of having uh, public private sector partnerships no 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 you didn't you know we couldn't sell this we went through a hard time and now there are some kind of realization that yeah we should have because it will take away a lot of the burden of uh public agencies taking care of conservation and you allow really qualified uh, companies to manage the ecotourism like Sabah Parks is doing very well. And you can see that Habitat is a result of the fine public and private sector uh, partnership which uh, Justine can share with us. So we regarded tourism concession as something really groundbreaking. If we can implement it, it's very slow, but it's gaining some traction, especially in, in Pahal. Next, please. Just three more before I end up in this one. Um, next. Oh, next to is, uh, <laughs> okay. So this is where the whole theme of this um, uh, webinar is. So we have six strategies and 32 actions for to uh, support synergy between ecotourism and conservation. Uh, we cannot regard community-based tourism as a niche anymore. We, in the plan, suggested how do we mainstream community-based tourism. We can do this through setting up a Malaysian CBT network and how we can strengthen the resilience of the tourism industry way before uh, COVID-19 become a global pandemic. We were aware of how, how low is our resilience. So that is the capacity building that we suggested under this focus area really wanted to build up on the lo uh, local uh, no, resilience, business resilience and other forms of resilience. Okay, that is uh, very difficult to achieve. But again, the plan sets the path to do this. Just two more, please. If I can push somehow the button to appear faster. Next one. Finally, second, fourth one. The fifth one is marketing. So it's not a main concern of our plan because we leave it to Tourism Malaysia. but. We understand that to, to market and to promote ecotourism, you must customize experiences. Uh, now we call it curate experiences because you cannot have a one size fits all. We have different market segments, so you have to apply targeted marketing. And 2016, social media, the use of IT wasn't that high in the agenda, but it is very now. But those are things that we feel that should be done to enhance uh, ecotourism marketing. We should have a social media strategy and so on. Next, the last one is cluster, which I already explained. And I know it's not here yet. So we developed the clusters. So those are the five areas. And if you are really interested, you can, I hope so, it used to be able to download it. So this is the last one. And we use it as a tool. It's a tool. It's not the answer, as I said. Uh, we use the clusters to develop thematic it can help in self-drive. It can help in creating uh, destination management organizations. So on the last slide, when it comes up, is just my conclusions. And I say that we have used the uh, cluster approach really as a tool. And what we have developed in the National Tourism Plan are not, it's not a blueprint to, to identify areas for development, but it's really a tool that can uh, assist in the planning, uh, assist in bottom-up, you know, process, and it will maximize the synergy between ecotourism and conservation. I'm sorry about, I've taken too much time, so thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, no, thank no, you. you have to stay here now, okay. Um, so thank you so much to the audience for putting up some really good questions. Um, there are very many, so I'm just gonna summarize the two big ones. Evidently, this is a tremendous plan. The work inside it and what's gone into it is impressive indeed. But the, I think a lot of people have posed the thing about that, why is this information not more publicly available? And how should people use it? So in, in, in the dreaming up of a plan, 
you have an ideal world where it's imperfectly implemented. So that is the first question. What would you like to see uh, with regard to this implementation plan uh, from all sectors? The second question, and I believe we can't probably deal with it fully, is this question, the perennial question of how can we make sure that uh, ecotourism does not then destroy the, the beautiful thing that is meant to attract people. So, um, uh, yes, so that's the question about, uh, yeah, you know, we, we, what, what needs to be done uh, to really get everyone to realize that uh, we have, you know, ecotourism, we have standards and things involved, right? Um, okay, so those two questions first. Okay, Justin, thank you. And I see a lot of questions, but yeah, the first yeah. one, uh, when we finished developing, when it was accepted, okay, there were three pilot projects that were recommended. And uh, one is in my kampung, lah, Taipei and Kuala Sepetang. The other one was uh, Sandakan Kinabatangan. The third one is uh, Kuching to uh, is it? Damai, you know, that whole corridor up to Bako National Park. So that was supposed to be where the state governments and all the stakeholders were supposed to come out and support this uh, cluster approach. And from my experience, I was no longer involved in that. So Ministry of Tourism, as you know, doesn't have any power over state land and how the things are implemented. So they were trying to educate the state governments. And the in Pera, firstly, they were showing a lot of interest from the government. Uh, they could have brought more the industry place inside. Uh, the exco was very com they committed, and they managed to start something, and then halfway it fell through. Uh, Sandakan, Chinabatangan, we thought that would be one of the areas where you can really e easily, uh, you know, implement this. But somehow, due to political changes, now it didn't really materialize. Um, Kuching and Bako did not get any buy-in at all. So surprisingly, the state that was implementing it without giving the status of being a pilot project was Pahang. So Pahang now, through the efforts of the Motec director, is uh, trying to apply this cluster approach and uh, is moving slowly. But I think the what I would have loved to see is, you know, how do we bring in more the industry players? Because all the while is very dependent on the usual, I'm sorry to say, you know, UPEN uh, being the driving force supported by the various agencies. When you get into that kind of uh, very top-down approach, it gets stuck. The, the plan wasn't meant to provide that you know, kind of approach. So that was a, the first answer. Uh, but I'm, uh, I, I think, finally, the plan is being understood by many of the government agencies many years after. So uh, what I would love to see was a nationwide workshop of trying to educate all the uh, stakeholders how to use the plan. So plans for me, I mean, it's easy, I, I did it, you know, but for people who are reading it, it looks nice, but how do you start, you know? And in some countries like Spain, for example, I heard that, whenever they have done such uh, tourism plan, then they have a national rollout workshop. So how do you implement it? So make people understand so that they can then be, I'm a, a part of the plan. So this is lacking in Malaysia. Yeah. How do we use the plan is a challenging part. Uh, the second okay. question, yeah. Second question, what was it again? Yeah, I think, never mind, because we can't really go into it to so much detail. Um, but I just want to, uh, unfortunately, of course, we can't, it very much depends on uh, good synergy between government agencies and their own familiarization, I mean, familiarity with the plan across agencies. I mean, that's not something we can answer right now. Yeah, so um, the question I have now is the COVID situation. Before I hand over to Ahmed and the other panelists, uh, it's interesting because we both tourism and conservation or nature-based tourism are affected by COVID. And that is interesting because that puts us in the same boat, right? Uh, and uh, it's a horror really, basically, because it, potentially if people are losing their incomes, it potentially means a really serious risk for wildlife poaching and other types of things. Yet the solution now is for everyone to pivot to back home, looking at Malaysians and the domestic market 
uh, to be to be interested in nature-based tourism in our own country because borders are closed. There isn't long, any longer the escape valve of expecting your international tourists, the more educated, the more evolved, the more well-traveled to drive it, right? So this therefore is a challenge to local tourism and conservation organizations to put those work together. So perhaps some thoughts on that before we move on uh, to the other panelists. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's easy to say that because of COVID-19, then it's, uh, you know, we can protect more the wildlife because then the, the human encounter, encounters with human will be minimized. But it's not really true because uh, we're talking about synergy between conservation and tourism. We need both, you know. Conservation cannot exist without real sustainable forms of nature-based or ecotourism, you know. So we need to come up with the funding, uh, the, the, the funding mechanism so that you know, income can provide a lot of uh, uh, money also for for conservation. So then we realized that we need both. But how can we do, we do tourism in a very responsible uh, way? This is the question. The second question too. I'm afraid that a lot of uh, people who are park managers, site managers, they are all trained in zoology, ecology, and so on. They're fine as 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 park managers, but managing tourists is a very different skill sets you know you do have you have to put in place destination management uh visitor management and even though can't, people going there could be people who are not really keen on eco tourism in the first place but you can put in educational elements so that you educate them so that you know their behavior is compatible with what we expect so it's always i look at this every opportunity uh Post COVID, that people will be more appreciative. People now, you can see that a lot of the surveys being done said that tourists, when they come back post COVID, they will go for spacious places, they will go to eco tourism, but dangerous if they don't know how to behave, you know. So, again, educating, visitor management are key things that we don't do that well. And that is uh, in our, I think, in the third uh, focus areas, we have a lot of actions on how do we educate, how do we implement these kinds of visitor management. Thank you. Okay, okay, Prof. Uh, before we proceed to the uh, to Dr. Pelf, I have a question uh, with regards to your slide. Uh, just now you mentioned in one of the slides, uh, you mentioned the synergy between ecotourism and conservation. Can you just uh, uh, explain a bit more on that? Uh, how uh, the the strategies that have been mentioned in the okay. the action plan can yeah can help conservation? Thank you. Uh, a lot of the community-based tourism in Malaysia are based in remote areas and rural areas, and they are located next to ecotourism sites. You know, and uh, the the fact that why the homestay originally in 1995 was launched uh, because it then was seen as the opportunity, you know, to provide uh, accommodation without. In spending that much money to for doing eco lodges, so these community-based tourisms are very in near to eco tourism. That's a, play a crucial role. I'm I'm sorry that I couldn't bring in uh, Mr. Walai Homestay, who's my been studying this homestay for many years, and what they are doing is the perfect example of synergy because they are selling community-based tourism not only as a place to come and you know uh, stay with the locals, but they are putting the systematic reforestation as part of the Kinabatangan corridor of life as the experience. So you go to Miso Walai, you don't do, that's a homestay, which usually you go and, okay, before you leave, you plant a seedling and you makes you happy that you are contributing to the, to the world. But this is called, I would say, this is environmental tokenism. So you get involved in a whole systematic replanting those areas have been uh, uh, you know, remove uh, from this vegetation. And those are systematic forests that will recreate the Kinabatanga corridor of life as part of the WF government's role. And all their activities are based on the uh, systematic reforestation, wildlife uh, research. And and by doing so, a lot of the um, youth that used to be involved in cutting down the forest are now very committed custodians. They are very well-trained guides. They are you know, uh, teaching tourists how to appreciate the nature more. So such kind of models are very difficult to get unless you have a plan from the beginning 
that you are going to do this as part of the, uh, uh, the synergy agenda. But a lot of the uh, CBT, for example, do not understand, you know, that you can uh, excel both in conservation and also ecotourism. So that the plan we, we are proposing are building on that kind of message, you know, that kind of a narrative so that we can include in a lot of the ecotourism developments, especially community-based, the elements of conservation uh, done in a very systematic manner, closely monitored, and then you can attract funding also from donors for, for, for both, you know, endeavors. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there, there's a question for you, Prof, where to get the ecotourism <laughs> master plan? I don't think it's for sale. Uh, it belongs to the Ministry of Tourism. And for many years, it was up there for you to download. I was told that it was removed because a lot of our con neighboring countries do not want to share their plans. I was, that was the reason why, you know, uh, Thailand and Singapore, they won't really put their whatever plan they have, you know, uh, as opposed to, let's say, Australia or Europe, whenever they do a plan, okay, it's for public scrutiny, you know, so you can't because of that. But if you go to Ministry of Tourism, probably you can. I have my copy, of course, uh, if you want, you know. Just write to the ministries so that we, they know that we are aware that we would uh, like the plan, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, last question for you, Prof. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, just now you were sharing your experience in Sabah uh, with Ms. Walai Homestay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people see that uh, a lot of opportunities for, tourist, for tourists to be involved in conservation in Borneo most of the time. So, a uh, question for you: Is there a huge market or huge demand for for conservation tourism to to take place in Semenanjung? Okay, I think in Sabah and Sarawak, volunteer tourism, uh, volun volunteerism is huge there, simply because uh, the there's the demand from the companies, independent companies that are specializing in this. And then uh, there's also because of the, the, the hunger. And I was, it's a crude word, you know. Uh, communities there are hungry for such kinds of um, uh, volunteerism, you know. And they are happy to be part uh, of the co-creation of experiences where tourists get involved in the in uh, projects and they also become, you know, uh, involved in the project research and so on but i don't see that happening that much in peninsula malaysia because of that you know uh, people do not the lack of hunger for that i think for me so very again i say harsh word uh, i don't need this anymore you know so how do you get that uh, the mutual benefits also extends beyond uh, monetary value so people cannot see that you gain a lot so you can see that many of the young kids they speak very fluent english you know, in the in Sabah and Sarawak, just because of community-based tourism and volunteer tourism. So again, <laughs> it's a good research topic. You know, why is the lack of interest among? So my own take is that you know we're not hungry. Semenanjung, we're not hungry for such, such kind of idea. Not hungry for food, but hungry for such kind of you know experiences and exchange. And NGOs could be also the factor that can. Help. Okay, thank you, for All right. Well, you know, I am sure that Semenanjung people in the live chat. Can please comment to the contrary, uh, have at it. Uh, meanwhile, Ahmed's going to introduce our next speaker who actually does a fair bit of volunteerism work. And so we're very happy to help you. All right, so Ahmed, you are you on. Yeah. So this lady, oh, <laughs> uh, based in Kemaman, uh, almost a decade working on river terrapins. And oftentimes, science, science alone is not enough uh, to save a species. You need the whole community to work with you. So we have now with us Dr. Pelf, who is the founder of TCS Turtle Conservation Society, which has been running this project in Kemaman to, to save the Batago Afinis, uh, the river terrapins. Okay, Pelf, uh, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you, Ahmad. Good morning. I'm going to share my screen. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Perfect. Let me go full screen. All right, let's do this. <laughs> um, well, Prof Amran gave a really good talk and I, I found myself nodding, nodding, nodding and taking notes. Um, a little bit of context, uh, we, 
we do uh, conservation projects and this eco-tourism, this phrase that I'm going to use uh, liberally, eco-tourism, is something that we felt uh, was important for us to get into to raise funds. So let's see how we do this. And Prof Amran, please, please share your insights uh, with us if there are anywhere we can uh, improve to make this more sustainable. Uh, my name is Pell and um, I co-founded this uh, Turtle Conservation Society of Malaysia, this non-profit organization back in 2011. So we have been operating for about nine years. Our vision is to return the symbolism of turtles to the state of Trangganu. Because you know, um, all previous Visit Trangganu Year logos uh, would have a, a turtle icon in it. Uh, in fact, the football team in Trangganu is called uh, Penyu. So we want to return the symbolism to Trangganu. And our aim is to restore depleted wild populations of freshwater turtles in the country. Uh, but how do we do that? We are a small organization. Uh, so we start with uh, research. Uh, I'm a scientist myself. Um, I study river terrapins. A lot of people do not know about them, but I've spent the past 10 years studying uh, river terrapins. And uh, we accept student uh, interns, student volunteers. So if you have uh, anybody who wants to come and intern with us, please uh, contact us. Uh, we do conservation. We establish a community-based uh, terrapin conservation project with the local villagers, uh, also back in 2011. We work with them very closely to secure terrapin eggs for conservation because the local villagers uh, consume these eggs. And for us to want to de uh, restore depleted populations of river terrapins, number one, I think we need to secure as many eggs as possible, uh, incubate them, hatch them, and then we release these uh, hatchlings, baby turtles, back into the Kemaman River. We do education because uh, I this is first-hand experience. I have spoken to elderly people in the kampung about not consuming turtle eggs, terrapin eggs. Their responses to me were, uh, me. Makan pun mati, tak makan pun mati. Uh, makan lah dulu. So then, then I realized um, this is not a very good way to spread awareness. So then we decided to tackle the kids instead. So we go to schools, we conduct uh, three-hour programs with children, and we educate them, we tell them each egg, if we leave them uh, in the sand, uh, incubate them in the sand, these eggs uh, will produce hatchlings. Then we can raise them and release them into the river. And uh, that's how we spread awareness to school students and uh, sometimes teachers. So far, we have conducted more than 100 camps and benefited more than 10,000 students in the uh, Trangganu area. So more, more in Kemaman than in other districts, but uh, generally in Trangganu. And because we have been operating for about 10 years now, the local Kemaman folks, uh, they know about our existence. And uh, sometimes they are offered uh, soft shell turtles because some people just uh, assume that Chinese restaurants would buy these soft shell turtles and uh, cook them. Um, but uh, luckily enough for us, they are uh, restaurant uh, owners in Kemaman. They do not uh, cook soft shell turtles but whenever somebody offers them these uh, soft shell turtles they would buy them up and uh, sometimes we, we still see this hook uh, in the soft shell in the soft shell turtles mouth so what we do is uh, we release these fishing hooks and then uh, we remove uh, and then we, we 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 remove the hooks and then we release these uh, soft shell turtles back into the river so in the past 3 years i think we have um, released more than 30 soft shell turtles uh, back into the river, like save them from cooking pots. Um, this community empowerment initiative is new. We uh, started it in January 2019. So one day I woke up <laughs> and I realized that uh, we have been working with the men in the kampung. We have been working with the kids in the local schools, but uh, we have not been working with the ladies. And I thought if we want to change a community, if we want to improve the livelihood of the local community, we should start with the women, not, not make them the last component. But we did it. We, uh, we, we established this uh, small informal group uh, to empower the ladies uh, to be financially independent. And uh, th these are the ladies who now produce our therapy-inspired uh, merchandise that we are selling on our online shop. Okay, so all this work that we do, um, 
it, it doesn't make any sense if we do not share this with people, if we do not share this with uh, the lay people, the public. So sometimes we get invited to put up exhibitions. We have been to places like a Publica, a Jaya One. Sometimes we invite ourselves. <laughs> uh, sometimes we give schools in, uh, we give talks in schools. Uh, we, we go to any talks uh, whenever we're invited, uh, regardless of whether it's a kindergarten or a primary school, colleges, universities. Sometimes we call the teachers and say, can we go to your school and give a talk? Um, we have distributed brochures, the Kapasa Malam, also in Kemaman, and uh, to, together with Perhilitan, uh, to encourage people to not consume river terrapin eggs. So we, we have done macam macam lah. And uh, also we have hosted, uh, we are still doing this, we are hosting turtle and fireflies uh, discovery trips uh, because uh, this is one of the ways where we can offer what we have in Kemaman to uh, people who want to learn more about turtles and how they can help save turtles. So what is a turtle and firefly discovery trip? So this was pre-MCO. Eh? So we used to conduct a 10-hour guided tour. We start at about 1.30, 2 o'clock. So our guests would have driven from KL, uh, Penang, uh, Malacca, somewhere, somewhere in uh, Peninsula, Malaysia. They would have driven here to Kemaman uh, early in the morning. They arrive here about 1, 2 p.m. We'll meet them and we will take them on a tour to learn about sea turtles. Uh, these trips are family friendly. We have had uh, grandmas, we have had grandpas, and we even had, you know, babies joining us, children. And then um, we, we had three destinations. Uh, number one is the sanctuary, sea turtle sanctuary in Cherating. Number two is our own terrapin conservation center in Kemaman. And number three, uh, we take them on a firefly discovery trip uh, to Cherating. We work with a uh, uh, fireflies uh, whisperer in Cherating. Uh, sometimes four destinations, uh, depending on whether the children, the kids want to uh, add on, uh, release sea turtles into the sea. And, and that depends also on the availability of uh, sea turtle hatchlings. So then we have uh, this... this uh, program, this trip, the self-drive trip. So I, I drive my car and my guests would drive their cars and they we all drive in the convoy, they follow me. And this trip includes uh, a dinner. Okay, so you know, we start at about 1.30, we end at about 9.30, 10 o'clock. It's about a 10 hour um, a trip. So who joins these trips? We have had uh, families, uh, we have had, we have hosted about, well, the, this firefly, this the turtle and firefly trips, I started it in 2011. Uh, back then, we didn't have a lot of, uh, we didn't gain any traction because we were so new. Uh, the program was so new. We were not famous. Uh, my first uh, clients were uh, a couple. My second clients were a couple. And my third clients were a mother and daughter team. And then from there, it... Uh, it expanded into two families, it expanded into uh, two cars, and then two bus loads. So who joins our trips? We have had families, we have had uh, friends who jalan-jalan cari makan dekat Pantai Timur. Uh, we have had students, including homeschooling students, kindergarten students, and we have also had uh, corporate companies who uh, come here to do our CSR with us. So we'll offer them this trip so that they can learn more in depth about the work that we do and how the terrapins and the mangroves are all connected. And then uh, we usually end with a Kotong Royong. Lah. So that's a CSR program that the company wants to do. Why do we do this? Um, number one, I, I strongly believe that kalau you tak kenal, you tak cinta. So a lot of people after these trips, they come to me and say, oh my God, Pelf, I never knew that they were freshwater turtles. You know, when somebody talks to me about turtles, I ingat penyu je. Because this is, this is all you see on National Geographic, right? The four species of sea turtles, they roam the oceans, so majestic, so charismatic. But when you talk about river terrapins, a lot of people were like, what is that? So, so I, I am a strong believer of um, education. Uh, spreading awareness is a second component because there is no way we could reach your friends um, if you're not here. <laughs> so we're actually using our guests as the bridge, you know, to connect us and the work that we do with the general public, uh, meaning your friends. And how can I have access to your friends if not through you? So we feel that um, to spread awareness, we would need to uh, uh, 
enlarge our networking, uh, our networks. We have to invest more in networking, talk to more people so that more people know about this. And finally, I'm not going to lie to you about this, but um, our edu tourism uh, trips uh, generate quite a bit of funding for us to sustain our uh, monthly operating expenses. So how much funds do these programs generate for us? Our trips typically generate 24 to 46% of our annual operating expenses. That's on a good year, that's like half of it. So I don't have to go around and ask for donations, you know, sell merchandise. We want to adopt a therapy. We just focus on getting people to come here and visit us. And that, that, is taken, that has taken care of half of uh, our uh, ex uh, operating expenses. So how do these eco-tourists, we call them, our, our uh, participants of our trips, our guests, our clients, how do they support our non-profit? So this is just um, a model uh, and we are using therapies as the mascot. And I think this applies to a lot of other non-profits in Malaysia. Um, for people who visit us, we charge them a, a 20 ringgit fee. Uh, for them to visit us and we tell them a story about how we started this program and how we have gotten uh, this participation from the local communities. And if they want to release a therapy, then we uh, put them up for a symbolic adoption, meaning you don't, you don't take it back. So you, uh, you give us 35 ringgit, we will give you a receipt and a certificate, and then we will take the therapies to the river bank with you to release these therapies into the river. So then kids, even adults, they have a closure. <laughs> it's not like I adopt a therapy, uh -huh, but where is the therapy, right? So yeah, come, let's, let's take you and the therapies to the river bank and let's release release them into the river. You can say a little prayer for it if you want. You can ask him to uh, come back later, you know, to, 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 to mate with the, the other females in the river, for example. Um, we also have merchandise. Remember the women earlier from my slides? Uh, we sell merchandise uh, as a form of uh, fundraising. And uh, whenever our tourists buy this merchandise, we make a profit uh, out of it. And uh, we'll, of course, we hope that our guests will share their experiences on social media. Uh, most times they will. Most times before they even get back to the hotel or like the husband is driving the car, the wife is already putting these uh, pictures or stories up on social media. And uh, when their friends ask them, hey, where is this? Hey, how come you talk in the I didn't know about this. So that's, that's where they will uh, help promote our programs. But how do this ecotourism support the local communities? Because we want this to be a win-win-win situation, not just one people winning, right? So our guest wins by getting this experience and this uh, knowledge and this uh, information about what we're doing. Uh, the NGO profits from it, uh, from the, what I just mentioned just now. And the local communities must also win because otherwise it's not fair. So what we do is when we have bigger groups, or not, not families of five, but when we have larger groups, we will order refreshments from the local villages. And we have been doing that since 2011. Uh, the sale of merchandise, uh, earlier I mentioned, the ladies sold this merchandise for us, so they get their upah jahit. So the more they sow, and the more we sell, the more we can order from them, the more they can sow, and then the more they can get from us, from this, the, the, the pro production of this merchandise. Improved infrastructure because we have always had, well, I wouldn't say always, because we have had a flow of uh, tourists, uh, local tourists, um, uh, foreign tourists. So we are able to talk to the local uh, head of the village to improve certain infrastructure like the roads, you know, at the long Lubang here and there, potholes. Whenever you want to release the terrapins in the river, you know, the road to the, 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 the river bank is no good. So we let the head of the village know that he does something about it. So that's improve uh, infrastructure. Increase civic pride. So for, for the longest time, Kampung Pasir Gajah is just one of the kampung in Malaysia. So many kampung, kan? But since we started this conservation project in Kampung Pasir Gajah, in Kem Aman, um, a couple of them are a couple of these local villagers who work with us, including the local uh, head of the village, including the uh, state executive councillor, uh, the Adun, they have appeared in numerous uh, newspaper articles as well as on TV stations, you know, um, being interviewed for uh, about this project. So I think that has also increased their civic pride. At least now they feel like um, they're doing something, you know. Uh, whenever Pekangmu Pasir Gajah appears on, on the TV or on Astro, they all feel very excited about it. So that's, that's the feeling we want to give them. So post-MCO, 
So we don't take our guests to all the other destinations because of the stringent uh, SOPs. Uh, so we now focus on taking guests to our conservation centre, which is in uh, Kampu Pasir Gajah. We give our small families, uh, we give them talks about the things that we do. Uh, we show them what we have in our gallery and then we take them to the riverbank. And we are offering this uh, experience uh, on weekends, uh, starting at 4 o'clock. You see this uh, flyer, uh, bottom left. So if you want to join us, uh, you please make an appointment because we are not there all the time. And if you have larger groups, we are we are happy to host you on a weekday as well. So we are continue doing this because uh, we feel that um, this awareness program, this education should not stop um, because we have a pandemic. Uh, we uh, This picture, the first picture in the middle, that was before the pandemic, so they don't have masks on. Um, but these days, we, we require that they wear their masks uh, when they are participating in our program. So we have had people who um, benefited, uh, guests, participants who benefited from these uh, programs. And we have had many of them who returned to us, bringing larger groups of friends, and especially the homeschooling community. I didn't know that the, you know, one of the first few families we hosted, they homeschooled their children. And then subsequently, they brought in more busloads of uh, homeschooling uh, children and parents because this is what they do. Because in you know, our homeschooling community, they homeschool their kids. They take their kids out for um, out of classroom kind of uh, hands-on experiences and coincidentally the work that we do matches with the, what, what their parents want for their kids. So here we are in Kampung Pasir Gajah. We are on Waze and uh, Google Maps. Um, but if you would like to visit, please visit us. Uh, please make an appointment first. Uh, we don't want you to wait for us 30 minutes dekat Kampung Tau because um, our office is 30 minutes away. So yeah, please make an appointment with us. We'll meet you there and we'll share with you what we do. And uh, we hope that you would then share with your friends. Right, we are also on Facebook. We are also on Twitter. We are also on Instagram. And uh, please go ahead and like your page. And if there's anything you think I can, we can learn from you uh, in, in, our, in our little journey, please, please let us know. Because um, I, I mentioned to you earlier, I have a science background, not an ecotourism background. And marketing, I don't know much about marketing. So very happy to learn from you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Belle. Thank you. Uh, before I... I get questions from 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 YouTube or from Facebook. I have a question for you. Um, from from yeah, the nine years that you've been doing this, uh, do you see that there's an increase? Uh, does people want to be involved in conservation? They want to do hands hands on in conservation. Do, do they do, look? Uh, and how much is it com in comparison between locals and foreigners? I mean, more locals or yeah, the pattern of the interest in your, your guests. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure whether this is because we've been doing this for a long while, but I think it is because um, we are gaining traction on social media, on Facebook. So the more people come to us, the more they go back home and talk about it, right? So it's like the ripple effect. So more people read about us and uh, naturally they want to come join us. But um, we usually get local uh, tourists. Um, Foreign tourists would be expats who work in Malaysia and they come over to the East Coast because maybe they think that um, they don't speak much uh, Bahasa Malaysia. So they takut nak datang ke uh, East Coast. You know? they, they are worried about, um, they, they are unable to order food, you know, for example. So what we do is we put together a trip like that so that uh, these people can, once they drive themselves to Kemaman, we'll take care of everything from here. You know, from food to activities to accommodation to, uh, you know, anything that they want to communicate with the restaurant owner or the local villagers, we can be their translators. So, yeah, on a regular day, we get uh, local uh, local uh, tourists, but uh, we do get foreign tourists as well, but not that many. And they usually come in groups. Okay, there's a question from Judy. Are the terrapins a protected species in Shungano and is it legal to take the eggs? <laughs> You're right, Judy. The terrapins is uh, the river terrapin is a totally protected species in the whole of Malaysia, and uh, you do not take the eggs without a special permit. But uh, as an organization, uh, TCS has a special permit from uh, Department of Wildlife and National Parks Perhelitan, and we are engaging this 
local villagers to collect these eggs and bring them to the hatchery for us. Because I, we cannot be on many riverbanks at the same time at night. And these terrapins only come up to nest in February or March. I can be on one riverbank, but there are so many other riverbanks in the river, right? So how do we do this? So we mobilize the local villagers. We pay them an incentive because I believe nobody should work for free. So we pay them an incentive. They, they do this work at night for us. And in the morning, they bring these eggs back for us to incubate. So that's the relationship we have with them. Uh, I believe there's another question uh, from Amarjit Kaur. You seem to work a lot with changing human behavior. What's the toughest bit? Which is the toughest bit? Do you think pushing for legislation will work better? I think um, we have to look at this uh, in a more holistic approach. Um, if one way doesn't work, don't harbor on it and cry and stress over it because there are a lot of other ways, right? So instead of harping on, instead of, you know, keep going after um, uh, legislate, uh, uh, policy makers, decision makers, we can always start with something first. And when we have a voice big enough, I think that's a lot easier to move things like legislation. <laughs> And that, that, that is our take on this. Um, I did not start out um, wanting to change human behavior in, in the sense that, you know, you and I were probably not talking about the same things. But um, the very thing we started doing was to want to encourage local villagers to be a part of this conservation program. I totally understand the fact that we cannot get the locals, especially the elderly, to stop eating turtle eggs overnight, you know, because if somebody comes to me and asks me to stop eating chicken eggs, it's going to take a long time for me to, you know, stop eating chicken eggs. So we have to be fair to uh, the local villagers as well. So what we want to change is, yes, behavior, but more towards um, getting them to, to save their opinion so that they can be the custodian. Because in a conservation project, uh, to ensure sustainability, you need the local local villages to be a part of it, not orang luar, you know, like an NGO who comes in and tells people what to do and what not to eat. So that's very important if we engage the local villages. Uh, have you had any local changing from, uh, from being a collector for eating or for consumption, then now we've changed, we've got oh, yeah. new to your yeah. Involved so, in the program. Yeah, so, so that's our therapy guardians. So previously, there were eight collectors in the kampong. And when we initiated this project in 2011, we got them to do this together with us. Uh, we came together at the riverbank. Each therapy, after she has done laying eggs, we measure them, we weigh them, we microchip them. We bring these eggs back. After three months, they hatch. And then after another four months, in September, October, we release these therapy into the river. And then I realized I didn't really need to do a lot of talking about it. Pachi, janganlah makan telur tu. Nanti dia membesar, nanti dia... No need. Because you just need to show people that this can be done. So it takes time. It takes a lot of time. And there are so many people in the kampung, in the nearby kampung, right? So it takes a lot of time. And I've taken 9, 10 years of my life doing this. But what is more important is that people see things. They don't care about what you talk about, you know, in newspapers, your charama, your speeches. But they see you. They observe you. Day in, day out. Year in, year out. We collect these eggs. We incubate them. And then we raise them. And then we release them. And we always invite the local villagers to come and join our release events. So when they are here, they release the therapies into the river. I'm pretty sure they feel something, right? Not. And I don't have to tell you what they feel. So what is more important here is that they feel it and uh, hopefully next year they want to work with us. So then we'll engage them, collect these eggs, send to our hatchery and we repeat the cycle. Okay, <laughs> thanks. There's a, a last question from Munira. Uh, uh, are you local from there? I wonder how you managed to get into the community there and build such a good relationship with them. No, I, I think I have to credit that to uh, 30 years of uh, belajar dekat sekolah kebangsaan. <laughs> so uh, I think my Malay is a bit better than the uh, regular kids. <laughs> um, I'm not local in Kemaman. I married somebody here, but I'm not from here. But, Where are you um, from actually? Uh, <laughs> I was born in Kuantan, um, but yeah, I studied Kuantan. Ipoh and Malacca. <laughs> Uh -huh. So, bukan dari Terengganu lah. Yeah, but I did, I, I spent more than 10 years in Kuala Terengganu doing my degrees, kan? But one thing is important is uh, to build that rapport, um, we need to always be present. So, I have attended uh, Kenduri Kawin, I have attended Kenduri uh, Chuko Jambu, funerals, wedding ceremonies. Um, 
whenever they invite us, we have to be there lah because they they treat us as a family kan. Sebab tu dia jemput kan. So to that that's one way to build relationship lah. It doesn't mean you call them every day. Show up. Show up and show them that we are in this for the long term. Again, I think that's how we gain friends and families. Okay, thanks, Belf. Uh, boleh rehat dulu <laughs> for the next yeah. round. Now rehat, go minum air sikit. Uh, right, now right. Uh, we're going to call Alex Lee of Terapuri. Okay, Alex. Okay, Belf, uh, we'll talk later. Okay. okay, so now I pass to Justin to... Yeah, to continue okay. with. Thanks, everyone. You're still with us. We are going to go till 1 p.m. and we'll, we'll get to your questions. Um, thank you, Pelf. That was brilliant. And it's so heartening to see that, that the business of communication and community building and networking is what's making conservation really start to take hold. Uh, we are so happy to be able to welcome Alex Lee from Terapuri Heritage Village. Um, Alex is uh, the CEO of Ping Anchorage, which has built a reputation for not just uh, showcasing nature the best way it knows how, but also the way that it's also showcased the culture and built heritage of the area. Uh, so Alex, uh, we're going to pull your slides up and leave it to you to tell your story. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Justin. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can share my slide first on my side. Try it when you try. Yeah, can I try? Okay, is it okay? Uh, not seeing anything yet. Okay, then I, I, I need you to help. Okay, let me, I've, I've got it queued up, so I'll do it now, okay? Just one minute. Yeah. So keep talking. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, thanks for having me. I'm from Tengganu. Uh, actually, I'm doing a project in uh, Satu, uh, which is Satu Wetlands. Okay, so... Um, Okay, let's, okay. Actually, uh, my project in steel is about restoration, restoration of Malay palaces. I've been collected this type of uh, palaces for uh, about 20 years, about 29 palaces or aristoc aristocrat house. So uh, back into 2005, and I found this land. Uh, this is uh, where, you know, when I drive, when I drove to Satu, so there's a signage land for sale, freehold with the phone number. Uh, then I take the whole signage with my car and settle the land. And uh, so then I got it. And uh, from there onwards, I start uh, planning for my, my project, my restoration project. It's an ecotourism project. It's about um, restoration of, of the old uh, Malay palaces. And also I'm trying to blend it uh, with the nature. Uh, which is uh, the steel wetland. Okay, next. Okay, uh, normally steel wetland, they are very rich with coconut growth. So uh, along uh, along the beach, you have coconut growth, and at the back, there's a mangrove forest. So it's very beautiful and very scenic uh, uh, place. And I understand from the local, the coconut is been, you know, those days, they, they, when they plant the coconut, uh, they plant with uh, the placenta of when baby was born, so the placenta and coconut, uh, so they, they, they plant each coconut with one placenta. So if you want to, to know how many population of Tengganu citizens, maybe you, you should count the coconut trees. Okay, thanks. Um, and um, the, the, the place uh, located at Setiu, and Setiu is very rich with uh, ecosystem. There's nine ecosystem there. Uh, very unique, uh, which is uh, one of kind in Malaysia that have uh, beside mangrove, you have uh, nipa, peat swarm, and also you have a uh, sandy beach, uh, beaches, all those things. And um, of course, uh, with those uh, ecosystem, uh, we are very rich with. Uh, we we have island uh, just in front of our beach, and you got turtles, green turtles come and lay eggs, repainted terrapin, and of course uh, river terrapin as well. So it's uh, very rich with biodiversity. And uh, next, so. Um, to when I'm there, so we 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 basically we want to start ecotourism, but uh, the destination is not popular, and we're thinking of uh, you know, how to to monetize uh, the whole uh, concept of restoration. 
uh, because the ROI will be very slow, but uh, we need to protect the nature. So uh, then um, I'm start selling the idea uh, to the state government and with uh, some NGO platform, how to turn steel wetland into a world-class wetland with the, in, with the version. Next. And uh, with the mission of uh, you know, biodiversity, R&D, because we got the local university there, U UMT, University of Malaysia, Terengganu. Uh, then uh, how to grow the local economy, community-based products, uh, how to make uh, the product more sustainable in terms of seafood, all those things, and how to champion local handicraft, uh, promote local culture and heritage, and um, with the, the idea of how to turn steel wetland into an eco-village, so a more green. Because before that, we have uh, we have big challenge actually in uh, Satil. Um, earlier part, they have like uh, the, uh, the state government approved uh, prong farming, about 1,000 hectares of prong farming, uh, silica mining. So then um, when uh, we are there, so we try to, to selling this idea. And uh, so this, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, slide being showing to uh, the state governments, uh, and we are very lucky enough because our the Sultan of Trenganu, he used to come to Terapuri basically every year. So uh, then uh, we tried to convince him. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, in uh, 2018, we managed to get Satil wetland at the first state park. So we got about 400 hectares uh, so turned into the state park. So it's the first state park in Trenganu together with another 30,000 hectares at Lake Kenya as a first state part of Tengganu. So after we, we start uh, pushing, pushing, at, at the end of the day, we managed to get there. Next. Okay. So we have very beautiful fishing village there. So uh, the local community, they live with, with the whole ecosystem. So we, we're thinking of how to turn this, you know, ecotourism. Uh, eco and of course, uh, I'm meeting with uh, my good friend, Prof Amran, where... Um, they come to study about their ecotourism uh, plan, you know, our national plan. And also, uh, we will try to leverage from the studies how, you know, to come up with an uh, ecotourism cluster uh, to, to make Satil is one of the destinations. Uh, and with that, maybe we can, we can help the community to grow and also we can protect the environment. Next. Okay, so we start introduce uh, a cruise, a mangrove a cruise to the tourists. This uh, this fiber boat is belong to the fishermen, so they use for fishing. And sometimes they you know, hardly get about 800 ringgit a month. So we then we start introduce a uh, cruise, about 45 minute cruise, one boat. You can see about four person, around 120 ringgit per, pers uh, per, per boat. So you can cruise and uh, we start introduce uh, during the cruise where to stop and where to stop next. And uh, one of the place, this is at um, well, one, one uh, called Pulau Laya in the river, in the in the steel Laguna ecosystem, uh, you have this Bruce Mata Boya. So we, we stop this, this is one, one of the red lists uh, under IUCN. So we stop to explore this place and uh, the, the tourists can, can get down uh, to this area. Next. And also, this is uh, Buah Sarang Semu or Kepala Bru. So, this is uh, on this island called Pulau uh, Telaga Tujo. The full, full of, of this uh, forest the, with all this uh, Pokok Sarang Semu. So, it's quite quite unique. You know, the, whole, the whole island with this Pokok Sarang Semu. So, uh, this is another stop. Next. And also, we managed to persuade... Uh, uh, the state government and then we, we we managed to get Petronas. Petronas donate about eight millions for the steel wetlands uh, project, two million for educational, eight million for light infrastructure. So this is the first boardwalk, about 506 meter that uh, we try to lobby and it built by local. So we, we guide the local to build 506 uh, meter boardwalk with a uh, Kayu Kulim. And now we, we are about five years and this uh, boardwalk will become one of the main attraction. And then this uh, at this area called uh, Pengkalang Gelap, uh, we also have activities to you know uh, planting mangrove replantings or all those activity for for the guests. Next, okay. And 
of course, we have like this is river therapying. We have released a re therapy project with Pahilitans uh, from time to time when we have a, a, a guest who, who want to, to do more, you know, eco, more meaningful activities. We can do that next. Okay. And of course, at night, we have cruise, firefly cruise. Uh, and this is a, another place where in Penarit, where the firefly uh, activities and another a local a boatman. So normally, uh, so we, we get the local operator to run uh, the cruise and uh, so that they can earn a living. Next. Okay. And uh, the, of course, the, the uh, kampung scenery, Setiu or Penare, uh, Manko, that village has been, I think, not, uh, known as the best, the most picturesque uh, fishing village in Malaysia. So a lot of some guidebooks are introduced there as a fishing village. So it's slow, slowly, uh, now it slowly grow, so it become uh, more and more popular, especially for the photographer. Next, and uh, yeah, another income from the community is uh, handicraft. So this is a kerechu. Kerechu is is a grass, so that they harvest and uh, then they will do a uh, tika, which is tika kerechu. Next, next, okay. And uh, this is another activity, the leka. Just now it's a leka. Can you go back to the previous one? Yeah, leka is another craft that they made from the the lidi from the nipah palm, and this is uh, very popular at Pengkalang Gelap area. So it's uh, one activity that we introduce. Uh, we bring uh, a lot of uh, student group to come to to learn to to make how to wave uh, how to do a leka in a one day program. Next. And uh, of course, uh, at Setiu, uh, we are along T1 Road, uh, which is, uh, you have very nice scenery of all the islands you can see uh, along the coast, like Pentian Besar, Pentian Kecil, Ruhentian, Pulau Lantenga, Redang, Bidong, and so on. So uh, this is uh, the area where the local community start uh, doing a small restaurant from small, and we start encourage that. Uh, from 2006 and when we are start opening our project in 2011 and now it become a, a popular destination for you know all the visitor to come and the local selling uh, the the seafood that harvest from the area so you have uh, in Terengganu we call Ikan uh, Celok Tepung is actually ICT ICT is Ikan Celok Tepung it's very famous in Terengganu and lately we have UV, and what is UV? Udang viral, and they become a, a viral along this street. So very nice. You can sit by the beach, have a you know udang udang viral ikan celut tepo, and also KLCC, and enjoy the view. Of course, the coconuts drink all those things. So we have um, quite a lot of entrepreneur, and this 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 thing we see that uh, how the you know the local. So they try to leverage from. A nice uh, scenery and slowly that we have tourists now is uh, become booming so uh it's very unique place yeah klcc meanings uh, kerapuk lekor cicak colet okay it's uh famous for trangano kerapuk lekor cicak colet okay next and uh lately uh, we have one pak cik this is Anku ali he's been collecting bottles along the beach uh, at satiu area because the water during the monsoon wash out, so different type of water from all over the world. So he come up with the ideas that you know, uh, turn into the a, a room of water or a, a small museum, uh, some water with the letter, all those things, and it become a tourist tourism content. So and also it's a very eco friendly process where you go to the beach and now a lot of children uh, bringing water for him, you know, selling to him. So he collected more than seven thousand bottles now. Next. Okay, uh, we have uh, released a uh, turtles program. This is uh, with w we work with WWF that based in uh, Penare. So like, uh, yeah, of course now is the season, uh, the hatchling of green turtles and later on we painted terrapin. So uh, the guests have to make early arrangement with WWF or we can help them to connect with WWF. So then they can have uh, some edu uh, occasional uh, tours on the turtles and release a program next. And uh, we come up with different souvenirs like batiks, and of course more souvenir that what we want. We want to 
to bring the souvenir into the next level. So we have some volunteer artisan that come to our place at Setiu. So now we try to work up from Leka, from Tika, so it will go down to better product. So at least uh, the local community, they can they can have more. Because now like a piece, a, a basket, a Leka, it just costs about 10 ringgit. So uh, we are trying to, to you know to uh, to turn out to design in, into more better uh, design craft so they can sell with more higher price. Next, okay, uh, this is uh, my project. Uh, my project is about uh, Terra Puri. The meanings of Terra Puri is land of palaces. We have twenty nine units uh, of uh, old palaces uh, that restore there. The palaces is about hundred to two hundred and fifty years. You know, as Rumah Bujang or Rumah Bujang Basrambi. Uh, if you see the gable on the, on the roof, uh, it's symbolic of Makara that live in, you know, uh, in Hindu mythology, the uh, Makara live in the river of Ganga. So, because in earlier kingdom, uh, we have Lankasuka kingdom that started in Kedah and disappeared in Patani. So, uh, that, that's how we, we have that Makara. The staircase also a symbolic of Makara. But when Islam arrives, slowly we don't have the makara, but you still have the outline of makara. Next, uh, the roof, uh, the roof tile, symbolic of the skill of the makara. Next, okay. and the dinding, uh, it's been carved so beautifully, and they, they call it as a dinding chanda bahias. Maybe to describe how beautiful is the wall. So the dinding chanda bahias. This is all 100% chengawu which is uh, now, yeah, some is about 250 years old. Next. And the staircase is always come with the odd number because they believe the God, uh, the Uncle Sunnah in, in Muslim. Next. Okay. Uh, one of the smallest window that we have, very small window with the gunungan uh, on the top. Next. Yeah, this is uh, the ash or gunungan they call on the top. It's a symbol of Meru. It's back to uh, Meru, where Meru uh, believed to be a part of God. Okay? And that's why the, the local cover uh, do it, you know, or in, in the palaces, you must have this uh, symbol of uh, you know, God in the old days. But later on, they transfer into flora panel, okay? symbol of how strong uh, of that kingdom. Next. Uh, this is a room of Bujang. Next. Okay. We, 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 we designed a special courtyard. At least we had to get local community to come here to perform. Uh, performance like Mat Yong, uh, Wayang Kule, uh, DK, DK, DK Karo, DK Bara, uh, and uh, Tarian Traditional. So all those things will, will happen here. So from time to time. So we have all local artisans will come and perform. Next. Okay. Of course, we we have some modern facility like swimming pool. Next, okay, uh, reading rooms. Next, yeah, some. Uh, uh, this is the room. Uh, it come with a carving, and also we are using old furniture. Yeah, this is a twin sharing uh, two two bed uh, room. Next, uh, the bathroom, the kitchens of uh, the Malay palaces, and we turn into the bathroom with the wooden bathtub. Next. So we believe that uh, Setiu, we can sell. It's not only the destination. So we, we, we turn out Setiu, we try to sell it as a, as a journey. So, uh, and we believe um, we can, we, we should work together closely with the state. We have to keep uh, putting a message to the state with uh, some NGOs, local communities, and also uh, we try to get corporate to sponsor. So with uh, 400 hectares that we get, the next we will get another 1,000 hectares as a state park and later on another few thousand hectares. So we're getting more and um, we also come up with the idea that uh, not all the place will be open for tourism. So the rest we will keep as a, as a state park. So the only small park would as a honey pot that we sacrifice for tourism, but very sustainable and the rest uh, probably next project, we try to persuade the state government how to do probably state, uh, you know, green financing, financing, all those things. And the journey that we have at Steel Wetlands, um, the guests can come, you can see the traditional boat builder, only one left there, very unique, how they build boat. And they use the, the skin of Melaluka's uh, trees uh, to, to, to place from uh, as, a, as a glue, so the water won't get in. 
the Satyu Scenic Drive, of course, very uh, beautiful. ICT, UV and KLCC. So if you are in Tengganu, you should try uh, ICT. Uh, fishing Village, of course, one of the best, the scenic fishing village in Malaysia. And conservation uh, of turtles, terrapins, fireflies and the river safari. And we have homestay. Also, we try to introduce ecotourism business uh, like kampung stay uh, for, for the local. So slowly after now, we have we have quite quite a numbers of uh, kampung stay that uh, from traditional house and some they build new new one, but very vernacular style. So it become very popular now. And of course, the two wetland, we have a steel boardwalk, the local handicraft, seafood, and we have Pranakan house as well there. And the breeze forest, the breeze forest is a nice forest uh, with Melaluka. So this is all that uh, we, we uh, turn into one journey that the guests can stop everywhere. We come out slowly, we come up with the brochures and some apps uh, that are coming up soon. Next. Okay, well, thank you very much. All right. Okay. Right, thank you, Alex. It's fantastic. Um, it is so heartening to see that your work has involved not just the 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 uh, putting together of a viable business, but actually becoming a model aggregator according to Prof Amran's uh, system of clustering. Uh, I guess my question for you is, um, I've lost my question. Ahmad, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Right. Alex, uh, do you think that if Terapuri or any other tourism activities have not been carried out in Setiu wetlands, yeah. what would have been, what would have been, uh, what would happen to, to to the nice nice place now if, if without without ecotourism activities there? That's why, right. um, yeah, that, that, that's what how happened with the prong farming silica mining, all those things. So if uh, we, we, we're not there, so uh, because uh, we have to, to, to you know, storytelling our, our you know, ideas to the local authority and local stakeholders that how potential is uh, ecotourism. Uh, with ecotourism, at least they can, they can earn an income. So now uh, uh, with that storytelling, and we have lots of NGO like Pawanis, uh, Sabah Steel, Ecotier that work together with us. So uh, then we have a workshop from time to time. Uh, we have a manage, 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 good management plan. So uh, we, with that, uh, we, we can at least protect that place. And also, uh, we also happen to uh, to, to get uh, some guidebook like Lonely Planet, Stephen Lusa from Germany to put Satyu Wetland in the world map as one of the ecotourism spots. So now slowly we see uh, more, more tourists, more ecotourists come and visit uh, you know, city wetlands. Yeah, so uh, with that uh, economy generate to the local, the local can uh, have their homestay or you know, kampung stay, uh, Airbnb. So we, we can see the economy start grow. And with the ICT, KLCC and UV, the, the, the food store that happened along the beach. So now it's getting more prosperous and it's sustainable. So uh, so they, they try to, you know, uh, how maybe inspired from Tarapuri architecture, so they have all vernacular architecture. So that that's how the message that we want, uh, you know, to 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 let the local community and also the the local governments uh, about the idea. And of course, uh, now also uh, thanks to the you know Tengganu state governments that you know really support our ideas. And now they have uh, the board of uh, Taman Negeri in Tengganu that believe in this idea and. Uh, but you're like Petronas, Motec also giving some fun. So we have two interpretive center now coming out in Setiu at Cabo Manco and Kalangala. So at least uh, we feel that with ecotourism, we, we can secure that nature that we have. And uh, one thing like every monsoon, after the monsoon, let's say uh, January and February, and along that beach normally, the, the fishermen with the fiber boat, they, they will go up to the sea netting for uh, tiger prawns. So normally their, their income one month, they can get about 10K to, to maybe some even more 20K for one, one boat, which is a, one boat man. So we can see the mangrove is a breeding area for all these tiger prom. So every year they can get uh, income. So it's very sustainable. Okay, I have a question. Um, 
pertaining since you're speaking from a businessman's perspective. Uh, so the question for you is how's business, right? How are you adapting to the current challenges? And what would you say to anybody who is starting to look at developing ecotourism business? What should people really set their sights on and prioritize doing? And uh, uh, yes, perhaps you'd like to share more on that. Yeah, uh, of course. Um, actually, when I start doing this project, so for for our our main purpose actually is our patience on this uh, project. So it's not it's not about business, but um, then when we start doing, we have to think on how to restore the the project. You know, for how to maintenance. And also how to pay our our staff because we, we use a uh, community based tourism where all the locals uh, work for us, and uh, with that so we, we try to come uh, to 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 come up with a business plan, how to monetize the whole project, so how to selling. So that's why we have to what we sell is we selling the whole destinations, okay, and we are selling it be uh, sustainable, and we try to tap the guests that you know come for experience. It's not come for karaoke all these things, but come for you know very green experience nature experience so we try to take on that type of tourists but we see uh it's moving it's moving very good but how to turn into the next level that uh, we can turn uh, you know more uh, more special content very eco-friendly so then we, we will have more uh, tourists but of course with a caring capacity yeah but that's why we carrying capacity we we need to to have a high yield tourism we have to sell a bit high so we are trying to approach the local also like homestay you are not selling like 100 ringgit or 200 ringgit per bungalow with two or three rooms, but you're selling about 500 ringgit one bungalow for two or three rooms. And and now we see that that's happened slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Ahmad, Ahmad, can you ask one of the questions from the live chat, please? Uh, yes. Okay. This, this is a question. Uh, how do you avoid pure? How do you, how to avoid pure pure commercial interest in studio project and continue the idea of sustainable ecotourism and conservation? Um, yeah, of course. At the moment, it's not uh, those who come and invest in uh, studio land. It won't be pure commercial interest because ROI is not there. See? So for us, for our team, so we become because of our our patient on our restoration or on the nature, all those things. And of course, uh, that's why we, we have uh, proposed all these guidelines to the state so that any future uh, development there, it should be sustainable. And any future that business to come, it should be you know, related with uh, ecotourism. And of course, uh, we want to, money, to, to turn that business, monetize that business as well. But uh, it must be you know, balanced between nature, uh, between culture and heritage, and also uh, commercial. Okay, so uh, there was another question from Armajit. Can we pull up that question? Actually, this question was like a personal question. We want to tap your inner inner thinking. I mean, what motivates you to do this work? Uh, and clearly, there's a lot of things that you need to do in terms of communicating, building networks. Uh, what gives you the motivation and the patience to do this work? Uh, well, I'm I'm grow up in Trungano, uh, but I see uh, Trungano is very potential destination where if we can turn into you know tourism uh, because we are, we are rich, we have the world oldest rainforest, Kenya Lake, Taman Negara, and now we have Taman Negri, and of course the islands Coral Reef. So how we have to uh, leverage on that? So that is uh, my passion to uh, at least uh, how to turn that that into eco tourism destination, and uh, I believe that Trungano can be. One of the top tourism accommodation we have, but we have to uh, take care of carry capacity. I'm started with Redang, a uh, dive a lot in Redang, but uh, uh, we don't control you know, carry capacity. Our coral, half of our coral is damaged. So now uh, we start pushing the, the state with, with, with the idea of carry capacity, less is more. Um, we do have uh, eco Trungano eco tourism conference and bring to co conference every year to selling all these ideas. Yeah, from there we starting. Uh, we see we see slowly that that result that we have uh, work with local authority and of course the royalty also uh, play the main role because they they support our project. They believe in our things and also we get thirty thousand hectares in Kenya where Kenya uh, we we work very closely with uh, Rimba. So uh, this is where you know and also of course uh, Rainforest Trust also support Rimba. So uh, with that uh, we we can protect uh, our. Our, our forest and our uh, uh, destination. 
Yeah. Okay, so uh, now is a good time to start bringing in all the panelists, and we're taking up from what you just talked about. Obviously, ecotourism is not nature tourism, right? It's tourism at a higher standard, uh, and it's a standard in terms of the product as well as the expectations uh, of people visiting the areas. So, um, I guess this question is about uh, actually asking the question from Professor Bunratana to all the panelists about certification. Right? Where do we sit in terms of what's off offer in Malaysia, and what we can, uh, we should be aiming for, and where the problems lie? Uh, probably, I would start with Prof Amman because <laughs> you got a head a peek at the question earlier. Yeah. Okay, very good question. Um, ecotourism certification is there are plenty all over the world. You have Green Globe, Ecotourism, GSTC. Uh, many of these companies try to sell this more than 10 years ago to Malaysia, but there wasn't any buy-in, you know? Especially, I think, why this uh, happened? Because the demand at that time, you know, the tourists were not, uh, you know, they didn't care whether this is certified as it doesn't do anything. But when certification is uh, attached to something else, for example, many, many years ago, British Airways holidays, they will only sell the tourism uh, packages only to those resorts or eco lodges around the world who have already obtained, for example, Green Globe certification. And then you are going into an exclusive club and tourists will pay a premium for such experience. And you can see that the uh, Savannah, um, uh, Tourism in Africa, they are all very high end. So do you want that to happen? Very elitist, there are pros and cons. And or do you want uh, everyone to have you know equal access to uh, ecotourism experiences? So, in terms of having a Malaysian and Malaysian-owned ecotourism certification, uh, or at least an ASEAN, you see Thailand's um, eco, I think uh, eco leaves or something. That is something that we can easily uh, replicate or even uh, join without having to. Um, reinvent the wheel. The problem about eco certification is it's very expensive. If you want to go into green globe, it will cost you 100,000. A small scale operators won't be able to afford. So the I can see the, the way forward is to just leverage on the Malaysian TQA, my TQA, Malaysian uh, Tourist Quality Assurance that is under our own MOTAC. It is uh, a one size fits all for everything but you can fine tune towards the ecotourism uh, sector and this has been in place for many years but many do not know i think habitat is uh, certified by my tqa uh, that the zip line in 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 langkawi is also zip, uh, so we can use that and that will raise the profile credibility uh, the only problem is that tourists now they look at travel advisor trip advisor they say ah you know, the user generator. So maybe for less discerning tourists, you know, they don't need that credibility given by Green Globe as long as they see eight over nine or trip advisor. Yeah, that's good. So things are changing. So how do you find that balance? No easy answer. It's a costly thing to do, but it's very, very good in terms of uh, credibility and reputation. Thank you. Okay. There's a question, There's a question for, um, for, um, for, um, from Sorry. from. Uh, who asks, uh, how would you rate Malaysia's potential as a leader in ecotourism within the Southeast Asian region, given our existing capacity and the quality of service? Okay, <laughs> this is one of those, yeah. How would you score us? What's good? What's What do we need to work on? Uh, Prof, okay. ask, um, it's for you. Yeah, this question. For me? Yeah. Yes, and everyone okay. actually. Yeah. All right, I just start and say that. First of all, I must say that the quality of ecotourism in Malaysia is uneven. Mm. We have Sabah you know, as a front runner. Sabah has managed to upscale its ecotourism. I would say that Sabah is deserving of a status of premier, premier ecotourism. Premier not only in terms of price, premier in terms of the quality, service quality, and the interpretation and storytelling. See? So how do we then scale up the other attractions, uh, sites in to follow the Sabah model? And there are many good 
uh, examples or principles that Sabah has done well. For example, by allowing concessions to bring in really reputable companies to manage ecotourism in a professional way and leave the government to manage you know, conservation. And that is the one thing. Uh, another thing in Sabah is to focus a lot on training for the, uh, the in, improve the quality of the guides. I would say that Mulu has got a much better training program. Every every Tuesday is a training day. So I think to scale up interpretation, also, uh, I saw in one of the comments uh, that how, how do you rate Malaysia's ecotourism? Uh, we did a study many years ago from civil one. Uh, New Zealand consultants coming to spending time in Kinabatangan and comparing their quality, the quality of Kinabatangan with Tripati Island in, 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 in New Zealand. And they rate our accommodation as almost the same, eight to nine over 10. They rate our attractions as almost the same level to nine, but interpretation wise, and I think the destination management, we were rated about four to five out of 10 compared to eight to nine in New Zealand. So we are so much lacking in the quality of interpretation that re reflects our training over guides, specialized uh, training that we need to bring the skills levels up to international levels and to be certified as, you know, for example, adventure guides it requires another level and that requires money too to train them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a question to Pelf, really. This question has to do with how can conservation organizations uh, work together? or And also for Alex, how can we team up uh, to strengthen uh, our the, the work uh, at this time in particular. Uh, uh, marketing and promotion is something that we need a lot of collaboration with. Um, I think, uh, how can, can you speak to those sorts of things? What would you suggest, even for the public that are following this session today, how could they help? Yeah. Come join our trips. <laughs> That's very direct. Yeah? That's coming from somebody who doesn't have a lot of background on uh, uh, marketing. <laughs> Uh, well, we, I really cannot think of other ways except come here and experience it yourself and then you would find the appropriate uh, words to describe your experience and that's the best thing because it's not fake and it doesn't come in a script, right? And to get people to uh, collaborate with us, I guess um, uh, we have had, actually to be honest, we have had um, previous uh, not so good experiences with uh, tour companies. They they bring guests here and they want to tell the story, but they they didn't walk in our shoes. You see, so they tambah garam, tambah tambah gula, and then the story you know sometimes were taken out of context. That wasn't something I like to hear back. You know from from our guests. So then since then we have been. Um, quite careful in selecting who we work with because um we did not set up this project and we did not initiate these uh, trips you know for tour guides to come in and say things like oh, kalau datang Terengganu, tak makan telur penyu, macam tak datang Terengganu. We, i don't like to hear things like that and it's hard because you know tour guides perhaps use that catchy line to get more people to come to Terengganu, right but uh, as a scientist with science background that's not something I want to promote. But yeah, um, our, our doors are open. Uh, we, we look forward to working with anybody who uh, can bring something to the table, can contribute something to the local uh, communities here. So uh, let, let's get in touch and uh, discuss more on this. Mm -hmm. uh, Amat, how about you? Oh, yeah. Alex, Alex, go ahead. Uh, well, um, ecotourism is about content. To make it ecotourism, uh, you know, one of the best destination for I mean Malaysia, uh, we have to put out you know very creative and innovative uh, content and leverage with the nature, heritage, uh, for instance, like habitat. So it's one of the creative, creative content. So I think that that is an idea how we leverage from uh, the nature that we have, the culture and heritage, uh, turn into very creative in our own way, you know, Malaysian style. I think that we, with that we can turn uh, Malaysia into one of the best ecotourism destinations. Thank you. Okay. Ah, uh, my. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, we only have few minute, few more minutes left. So I think I have one question to all the panelists. How to how to go forward? How to push? Uh, so that ecotourism supports conservation. Either uh, nature habitat conservation or species conservation. What Pelf is doing. How how do we push so that we have more of that 
we have more options for uh for locals we have more options uh, maybe later for international for foreigners to come and visit and to to know that it's not just a jalan jalan trip but it is uh tourism with a with a purpose okay uh yeah open to uh okay, all let's keep your answer short uh, uh yeah keep your answer short and then prof is going to explain to us how we're going to use the second session of the web forum okay uh starting with prof uh so the answer the question is how can ecotourism and conservation support conservation more directly okay are we having something okay, maybe, maybe yes, I, 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 okay, okay i'll start yeah. Right. Okay. So this is something that um we should look forward. That uh, we we should look into doing is to have um. Uh, Who do you say we? Say, sorry, we're saying oh, we. This yes, huh? <laughs> because yeah. we're new in doing this eco tourism thingy, right? But I really would like to meet with somebody from uh tourism, uh to maybe they do not pro promote uh our therapy projects or our ter uh, our eco trips because they do not know about us right so i look forward to having a working relationship with the uh, tourism with tourism Trunganu for a start uh to to at least inform them of this thing that is happening in kamaman and then uh, look at ways to how to put this on the table for everybody so hopefully using this model uh, more such um, smaller projects that are um not big. The smaller projects in Trunganu will begin. Uh, will kickstart their own uh, eco tourism project from uh, their own backyard, so to speak. Okay. Okay, Alex. Yeah, I be, I believe that uh, to creating more uh, niche products that uh, you can turn the destination to be a you know, wow uh, destination. For instance, like in Lake Kenya, we have uh, nine species of hombe that. Uh, if you uh, it is, uh, if the tourist there you easily you, you can you can see four or five species of hombe at any time uh, you know one or two, uh, if you spend one or two days so that that type of niche tourism that we need to have more and probably like a uh, fly fishing you catch and release so very more green uh, green adventure that that uh, type of program or, or maybe a cultural program that you know you go to the institute you know, that we be the culture so the activities that niche activities that we, we can have more niche activi activities so then you can have a different uh, background different niche uh, tourists that you know, eco tourists that come to malaysia okay thank you, thank you. all right uh, we have a fantastic question from muna noor who's asking us uh, about morocco okay morocco if anyone has been there sorry Pels, can you turn your mic off? all right um, um, morocco is such an amazing place but yet it doesn't have the critical mass in terms of tourism accommodation that would make it really take off. Sadly, that's a very long question to answer. So let's put that pin in it for next uh, the next web forum where we really do a detailed analysis of what's missing and what really needs to happen. So right now, I'm going to ask Prof Amran to talk about uh, how he wants to use the next session. Uh, Prof? Okay. Um I would like to share the work I'm doing now in Jirai, uh, Gunung Jirai Geopark. It's not Gunung Jirai by itself, but the whole area, you know. Um, what I'm trying to build on is that we have so much passion already, you can see, for both conservation and ecosystem. Possibly, we might want to add a bit more methodology, technique, tools, you know, so, so that we can really... I'm... Uh, systems guy, person. I'd like to see how these systems work. And I can share, we are using what is called uh, Ecotone in our analysis. And I see many of you are familiar with that. Ecotone is just trying to show the different uh, ecological tones. And the Gunung Jirai Europa has got four different you know, the mountain and then the mangroves and the, and the coastal areas. And using that one to show uh, what are the threats to the current uh, eco ecotones and what interventions can we apply to restore, to improve, and then use the different ecotones. In that includes the uh, paddy plantations, because the man-made to develop experiential uh, tourism experiences, rural tourism, and that links to the sustainable livelihoods of the local people. And also it's all conservation, sustainable livelihoods, uh, and ecotourism, and sharing that, to show that we can approach uh, a better kind, a better way of uh, developing ecotourism, 
uh, based on really sound methodology. Maybe that's okay. for a start. I'm still working right. on this. Okay, so we, we are going to do uh, your Gunung Chura case study. We're going to do a Marapo case study. Uh, we have also got Ulumuda as a case study as well. Right. If anybody would like to volunteer their particular area of interest and project as a case study, we will consider it so that it's meaningful to you. Um, at the, uh, the final thing that I just would like to say, uh, you've heard the word habitat quite a few times. The habitat for people that don't know is a rainforest discovery park on Penang Hill, which has a unique model in the sense that it's building a system of running a park in which all the proceeds go towards its own operations and the, anything beyond that goes towards conservation. Uh, so this is uh, what we consider to be an important platform in demonstrating sustainability. Uh, we are now launching our sustainable tourism platform, which will provide some of what we are missing in this story, which is telling of particular case studies of where people should visit. Uh, and we would like to start building that with some of the stories we're hearing here today uh, so that we can help to provide, be like an unofficial, unofficial tour guide uh, to where all the best quality conservation and ecotourism is so far and then document best practices there. All right, okay, so this means that we're going to have to call an end to today's session. Two hours plus is really hard and thank you so much for staying with us and your interest. It's been really interesting to read your comments. Uh, so I want to wish you everyone to say bye <laughs> um, and um, make sure you make time for the next session. All right. Uh, we will try to answer some of your questions. I hope all the panelists go into the live chat comments and put in a longer form answer to some of the essay length questions that are inside there. Okay, so from me, uh, thank you very much from the Habitat Foundation for today. Okay, put on your mics then, you can say goodbye, goodbye. Yeah. Thanks to Prof, yeah, thanks to it. Alex, thanks right. to Pia. Goodbye. Thanks to all the viewers yeah. on Facebook, Bye. thanks to all the viewers on YouTube. Bye-bye, thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Udang celuk tepung now.